Amen. Well, again, this is the first week of Advent. And so um, we are going to take a little bit of a short break from our series through Galatians through the end of this year. And we're just going to focus on the birth of Christ as we always do during Advent, as we always do during Christmas time. But this year, we're going to give a, some special attention to some ways in which uh, the coming of Jesus was foreshadowed in the Old Testament, done through prophecy, uh, done through imagery, done through types. And, and this is important for us to remember sometimes because it, it's helpful for us to remember that the coming of Jesus was not like a last ditch effort by God to save mankind. Right? Like it wasn't as if God had exhausted all of their options and sending his son to take on flesh was kind of like the nuclear option when everything else failed. No, the coming of Christ to redeem his people from the slavery of sin and death was always the plan. And by God's grace, he gives us these pictures and these shadows and these prophecies and these images all throughout the Old Testament. And so this morning, what we're going to do with the Advent theme of hope, we're going to see that there was always hope for mankind, for God's people from the very beginning, even immediately after the fall of mankind. So let me invite you to take your copy of God's word and turn to Genesis chapter 3 this morning. Genesis 3. And as you find your way there, uh, I want you to consider just for a moment that throughout history, um, literature and film have been filled with stories uh, of heroes that save the day by slaying some kind of snake-like creature, oftentimes a dragon. Yeah, like, can you think of any of those stories off the top of your head? Uh, I, I can give a few examples. So one example in Christian literature is the book, The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Many of you have probably read that book. In it, if you've never read it, Bunyan tells this allegorical tale about this uh, main character, Christian, who's making his way to the celestial city. And on his journey, he meets all kinds of characters. And all of those characters are a means of depicting various, ex various experiences of the Christian life. And there's one point in the story in his journey where he meets and he battles this character named Apollyon. And Apollyon's the, the prince of the city of destruction. And Bunyan, he describes this character this way. This is what he wrote. Now the monster was hideous to behold. He was clothed with scales like a fish and there is pride. He had wings like a dragon and feet like a bear. And out of his belly came fire and smoke. So again, this serpent-like dragon creature that Christian has to battle on the way to the celestial city. Uh, another example, this is a non-Christian example. I don't know if you've ever heard of this before, a little more obscure, uh, but it's called Harry Potter. Um, uh, it, that series is filled with snake imagery, right? So like, for example, just a few uh, examples. I mean, one of the houses at Hogwarts, the one where all of the bad guys come from uh, is called Slytherin. The snake is its symbol, right? There's so many other things like the main villain. He has a snake as his loyal sidekick. There's this like, the special snake language that they can all speak and talk to one another in. And, and there's just so many other examples. I mean, even less popular stories all tell this tale in some way. So for example, again, my youngest daughter, she has a, a children's book. It's called Unicorns Are the Worst. And uh, it's a pretty fun little book. It, it tells the story of this, this troll and just page after page, he's complaining about his unicorn neighbors and all the ways that they're the worst until one day he's attacked by a dragon and the unicorns actually come to his defense and they defeat the dragon. And the book ends with the troll at a tea party with the unicorns and he says, well, actually dragons are the worst. Um, I mean, there's countless stories in popular literature and history that describe some kind of hero or heroes that face the serpent or face this dragon in order to save the damsel in distress. And the reason for that is that because those epic stories, what they're doing is they're echoing the greatest story, the story of redemption, the story of the gospel. Like this is our story. And so many stories tell the story. And we're going to see clear, this clearly this morning again, beginning in Genesis chapter 3. So do you have it? We kind of know the context, right? Genesis 1 and 2, this is the creation account. God creates the heavens and the earth. He creates everything that, that fills the heavens and the earth. He creates the first humans, Adam and Eve, places them in the Garden of Eden to tend it, to be fruitful. 
He gives them some very wide boundaries in which they're to live under his good rule and reign. Really the only boundary is that they, they don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We see that in Genesis 1 and 2. And then we walk into chapter 3 and everything goes terribly wrong. Right? We read this in the first verse of chapter 3. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And so here we have Adam and Eve, they're in the garden under the reign of God. And then we're introduced to this other character in the story who's only identified here as the serpent. And the text doesn't say who the, the serpent is specifically immediately here. But we do know from other places of the Bible who he's referring to is Satan. We see that in Revelation 20, for example. And we understand the Bible describes Satan as the great enemy of God, the great enemy of God's people. That he's this created being who's rebelled against God, who's fallen. That he doesn't work alone, that he leads a pack of other fallen angels we know as demons. And the Bible describes Satan in many different ways. Uh, ways like he's the tempter and uh, the enemy, the evil one, murderer, deceiver, sinner, father of lies, and so many other ways. And we see him kind of live up to those uh, descriptions here in chapter 3, verse 1, as a deceiver and father of lies. Because what does Satan do? He, he tempts Eve to do what God tells them not to do. And the way he tempts them is to doubt God's word and to doubt God's motives. So there in verse 1, he says, I mean, did God really say that? Maybe he misunderstood. Maybe he didn't really mean it. Later on, if you read in chapter 3, he doubts his motives. Basically saying, God must not care about you that much. God doesn't really want the best for you. So you should do otherwise. Right? And so Adam and Eve, we know the story, give in to the temptation. They eat, they sin. And from then on, sin enters into the world and humanity. We're not going to read the whole story, but the story continues there in chapter 3. And God comes and he confronts Adam and Eve and the serpent. And he pronounces judgment in the form of curses on them. And the first curse is on Satan. Uh, the first part of the curse there in verse 14. And in reality, the whole Bible could end right here. Right? Like he could just stop. God could end it all. He could wipe it all away. Because God did, again, did tell Adam and Eve that if they ate the fruit, they would die. They can't say he didn't warn them. So again, the Bible could easily end here at verse 14, but by God's grace, we get verse 15. So Genesis 3, verse 15. God pronouncing a curse on Satan says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There's this amazing promise. And, and, and we shouldn't miss this, that, that in the midst of pronouncing curses, in the midst of pronouncing judgment, God still brings a promise of future redemption. Like notice in, in the story, in the context, before God even gets to Adam and Eve, before he even gets to pronouncing judgment and curses on the man and woman and the rest of creation, God offers hope. And this verse, Genesis 3.15, has everything to do with Christmas. Got everything to do with Christmas. In fact, uh, the 18th century preacher George Whitfield. He once preached a sermon uh, on this verse and, and, and he opened up uh, the sermon after reading the verse and he told his audience, on reading you to you these words, I may address you in the language of the holy angels to the shepherds, the ones that were watching their flocks by night. Behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. Now why? Because what God says here is that there is going to be a redeemer who's going to come. He's going to be born of a woman, and he's going to defeat the serpent and make all things right again. And in fact, theologians have called this verse uh, in Latin, the Proto-Evangelium, or what that means is the first gospel. The first gospel, because this is the first time in the entire Bible that the gospel is presented. Not fully, but it's there. The gospel's there. In fact, Calvin said that in Genesis 3.15, it's almost as if like a, flu, a few slender sparks beamed forth when God said that. So it's kind of like if you wake up in the morning, the sun's already out and you kind of pull the curtain back just a little bit. So a single light fills up the dark room. That's what Genesis 3.15 is for us. 
Or you can think of it as kind of like the acorn of the Bible. This acorn that, that sprouts up eventually into the fullness of an oak tree. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it's here that this initial promise that God makes, he says, I'm, I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to defeat the serpent. I'm going to defeat the one who's brought chaos to my creation. So this is a very, very, very important verse just in the opening verses of the Bible. So highlight it, mark it up, circle it, highlight it. Um, but let's, let's look at it a little bit more in detail. Genesis 3.15. Again, he says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Again, God says, Listen, I'm going to put enmity between you, between the servant and the woman. Enmity is a word we don't really use a ton today, but if we kind of understand what it means, right? It's this idea of hostility or this posture of animosity. That word is actually used in other places in the Old Testament um, to describe in one place, kind of like the idea of nations that are at war with one another. We see that in Ezekiel. It's used in another place in Numbers to describe the kind of hatred that brings about murder. Um, The point is, like, it's not like they're just going to be frustrated with each other. What God's saying is there's going to be an enmity here. There's this foretelling of this life and death struggle between Satan and the offspring of the woman. Again, he says it's between you and her, between your offspring and her offspring. So the question is, like, who's he talking about? Who's the offspring here? Well, offspring here represents both a corporate identity as well as an individual identity. Both a corporate identity and an individual identity. Here's what I mean by that. The Bible presents humanity as divided into two groups of people. The redeemed and the non-redeemed. The saved and the lost. Those who belong to God, those who belong to Satan those who are citizens of the kingdom of God and those who are citizens of the kingdom of Satan. And Jesus uses this kind of language, for example, in John chapter 8. Notice what he says uh, to the religious leaders, verse 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? Well, it's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You're of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Jumping to verse 47. Whoever is of God, hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you're not of God. Again, Jesus Uh, telling them and telling us there there are two groups of people throughout history. Again, those who belong to God, those who belong to Satan. And naturally, there's an enmity between the two. But there's also an individual identity at play here. Uh, See, the word offspring in this translation can also be translated as seed. And this theme of a seed runs throughout the entire Bible, especially here in Genesis. And, And so, for example, later on, we get this promise that God makes to a man named Abram or Abraham. And this promise is both to him and his offspring. So this idea of a a corporate people, this, this nation out of the man Abraham. But then we learn later in the New Testament that there's actually a true seed, a true offspring. And it's an individual, the person Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul talks about this in Galatians 3, verse 16, when he explains, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. So all of that to say, when God pronounces this curse on Satan, he's referring both to to this battle between the people of God and Satan, and most importantly, between Jesus, the true seed of the woman, and Satan. In fact, this becomes clear the second part of the verse, right? When God explains that in this battle, in this hostility, in this life and death struggle, the offspring of the woman would actually bruise Satan's head while Satan bruises his heel. Some translations say crush. It can also mean that as well. But the main idea, the main emphasis is on those words head and heel, right? We know that a head injury is far worse than a heel injury. 
Someone hits me, I'd rather be hit in the heel than in the head. And the idea here is that, that someone's going to come and, and even though Satan's going to cause him to suffer, there's going to be some pain, there's going to be some injury, he's ultimately going to kill Satan. While his heel is harmed, Satan's head is harmed. Again, the main point is this redeemer, Jesus, he's going to come and even though he's going to suffer. When he's put under arrest and he's beaten and he's nailed to the cross, in so doing, he delivers a fatal blow to our greatest enemy, Satan, in sin and death. This is the promise God makes for us in Genesis 3, right as things go wrong. So it's an incredible promise at the very beginning of the Bible. And it tells us a ton. It tells us a ton about God. It tells us a ton about the gospel. It tells us a ton about our future and so much more. What I want to do in our time that's left, let me just give you three lessons I don't want us to miss from the first gospel of the Bible, Genesis 3.15. Just a few lessons here. Number one, we need to understand that the church has an enemy, but not a conqueror. The church has an enemy, but not a conqueror. We understand that throughout history, the the church, the people of God have have faced hostility. We face persecution, physical violence, death, even still today. Our brothers and sisters in uh, other parts of the world really do face this on a daily basis. And this all stems from the fall. Again, God says there's this enmity between the offspring of the woman and the offspring of Satan, led by Satan. In fact, we won't turn there now, but uh, read Revelation 12 sometime. John gets this vision uh, of this spiritual reality where he he sees this great dragon, this representative of Satan in the book of Revelation, who who makes war, he says, um, against the woman and her male child. But he gets frustrated because he can't kill the male child. And it says that he turns and wages war against the rest of her offspring. What's he saying? Satan wants to attack the church, God's people. Because he can't kill Jesus. And so what does that teach us? Well, it teaches us that as the people of God, we shouldn't be surprised by hostility we face as we seek to follow Jesus. Right? Like this is just a reality. We should expect it. We should be prepared to endure. But we, as we do that, we ought to recognize who the true enemy is in Satan. He's the real enemy. And so as Peter warns us, as we saw a couple series ago, when we went through 1 Peter, be alert. Watch out. Why? Because Satan's on the prowl. He's looking to devour. He's real. He's hungry. He wants to cause destruction. And so we're reminded, live with eyes wide open to the reality that you do have a true enemy. However, understand he is not your conqueror. He's been crushed by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And because of your repentant faith, in the finished work of Christ, you actually get to share in that victory. You get to stand over him as his head is crushed beneath the heel of your Savior. Yeah, we have an enemy, but he's not our conqueror. In fact, this is what Jesus means when he says this to Peter in Matthew 16, verse 18. He says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What's he saying? There's an enemy, there's a battle, there's hostility. But the enemy won't prevail. It's this truth that enables Paul to say to the Roman believers in Romans 8 and verse 37 when he says, No, and all these things were were more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What do you say? You're going to face some struggles. You're going to face some hardships. You have a real enemy, but he doesn't conquer. You know, in fact, actually, we're more than conquerors because we follow the one who's crushed the head of the serpent. In fact, Paul later, at the end of Romans, he gives probably uh, my favorite benediction in all of the Bible in in chapter 16, verse 20, when, when he writes to them, he says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What's he reminding them of? That because you are in Christ, because you are united to him by your faith, his death becomes our death, his resurrection becomes our resurrection, and his victory over Satan becomes our victory over Satan. He says, someday soon, 
the Lord will crush Satan under our feet once and for all. So let me ask, do you feel defeated this morning? Like, do you feel conquered by your sin today? Do you sense your enemy gloating over you this morning? Well, can I encourage you? I just want to encourage you with the words that, that Charles Spurgeon encouraged his church. This is back in 1876 when he preached on this sermon and he says it so well. This is what he said. Let us resist the devil always with this belief that he's received a broken head. Let us do this bravely and tell him to his teeth that we're not afraid of him. Tell him to recollect his bruised head. We know him and we see the deadly wound he bears. His power is gone. He's fighting a lost battle. He's contending against omnipotence. He's, he set himself against the oath of the Father, against the blood of the incarnate Son, against the eternal power and Godhead of the blessed Spirit, all of which are engaged in the defense of the seed of the woman in the day of battle. Therefore, brethren, be steadfast in resisting the evil one, being strong in faith, giving glory to God. Again, the church has an enemy, but not a conqueror. Make this a little bit more personal. If you're a Christian, you have an enemy, but you do not have a conqueror. The second lesson we, I want us to make sure we grasp it is the end is not a mystery for us. The end is not a mystery, so our hope is not a fantasy. Again, the end is not a mystery, so our hope is not a fantasy. Like the ultimate end of history, the ultimate end of our story is not a cliffhanger. Right, like we're not anxiously awaiting for that last page to be turned so we can find out what's going to happen. We don't have to sit on the edge of our seat um, waiting for that last episode of the series to drop because we just have to know what happens to our favorite character. Like we don't have to do that. I mean, even though not all of the details are presented there, the end is known from the beginning. That Satan and his minions will be defeated by God's promised redeemer. And so you really can look to the future with confidence. And the reason is the Christian life is one in which you can joyfully and boldly walk with this assured assurance of victory rather than a prospect of defeat. You really can live that way. Like, never think that hope, when the Bible talks about hope, that hope for a Christian is, is walking through life with fingers crossed. It's not walking through life wishing upon a star. But the end has been settled. Jesus has won. And we as his people, we get to live out of this shared victory today because we know that victory will be truly realized one day. That Jesus really will come day, someday soon and finish grinding the head of Satan into the dust for all eternity. Again, the end's not a mystery, so your hope is not a fantasy. You can set your heart on it, your life on it. But third, I would say the lesson we need to grasp this morning is that the gospel is the antidote to the serpent's poison. The gospel is the antidote to the serpent's poison. There's this other great picture, this other uh, imagery that's given to us in the Bible uh, along this theme. And it's actually found in the book of Numbers. And in Numbers 21, uh, we read about this time in Israel's life. They're, they're walking through the promise or through the wilderness to the promised land. Not quite there yet. And as is the case, so often in their journey, they're, they're complaining against God. Um, they're rebelling against him in their attitude, their words, their actions. And God actually sends judgment on them in Numbers 21 in a very unique way. Um, he actually sends venomous snakes to bite them. But in the same breath, he, he tells Moses, he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to fashion a serpent. I want you to put it on a pole. And I want you to lift it up and tell the people, if you're bitten by a snake, just look to the pole and you'll be healed and saved. What's God doing? He's giving us this picture, isn't he? Of what Christ on the cross is for us. In fact, Jesus refers to this in John chapter 3. Listen to what he says in verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That Jesus, in taking on flesh, in being born of a woman, going to the, the cross, Jesus takes the bite from the serpent for us so we don't have to. That in this life and death struggle uh, between Satan and us, Jesus, again, taking on flesh, being born of a woman, he's associating with humanity. He's taking our side in the struggle and he fights on our behalf. 
And now anyone who looks to him and repents in faith is healed. And so when you feel the stinging bites of the serpent at your heels, like when you're tempted to believe his lies, when you're tempted to believe and own the condemnation that he whispers into your ear, when you're tempted to be swallowed up by fear, when you're tempted to be overwhelmed by the prospect of death, when Satan bites, what do we do? We put on the gospel that's crushed his head. In fact, Ambrose, this fourth century church father, he, he wrote, once wrote this on this, ver- this verse. He says, let's put on sandals of the gospel that shut out the serpent's poison and blunt his bites. And especially if you've never trusted in Christ this morning, you've never looked to him in faith, you've never repented of your sin and self-righteousness, you've never trusted in him for your salvation, we need to say, you need to feel the bite of the serpent on your soul today. You need to feel that and sense that. And even though it's a death blow, the good news of the gospel is that if you look to Christ this morning in faith and repentance, you can find healing in life. Why? Because you're looking at the one who crushed the serpent. You're looking to the one who's a crushed sin and crushed death. And by your faith in him, you join him in his victory. But for those of us who've done that, who are Christians this morning, we know we don't always walk in confidence, do we? We don't always live life with this kind of hope. And and when we find that we lack hope, what we do is we often find a lack of belief at the root. In other words, we're we're not um, believing that Jesus has overcome Satan. We're not believing that Jesus has overcome death. We're not believing that Jesus has overcome sin. We're not believing that he's graciously swept us up in his arms this side of the battle and promises never to lose us, never to turn away, never to forsake us, but will bring us for all eternity with him. And so at times we need to remember that truth, take a deep breath, remember Jesus has crushed the head of our enemy for all, good, for all times.